Okay, let's finish up plant form and function. So what happens with double fertilization is that <clears throat> after the pollen is dispersed, it germinates, the pollen grain just germinates, and the two sperm nuclei travel down to what's called the pollen tube, and they work their way down to the ovule. And there's an opening in the ovule um, known as the micropyle. And you can see this here in the embryo sac, we have these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight cells. And these are all haploid cells. Again, being the gametophyte, it's a multicellular haploid structure. The most important ones here are what are called the polar nuclei. There's two of them and the egg. Again, they're all haploid. <clears throat> what happens is in double fertilization, one of the sperm nuclei fertilizes the egg to form the zygote. The other one fuses with the two sperm nuclei to form a triploid structure that will develop into what's called the endosperm. And the endosperm will make up what's the bulk of the cell, these triploid cells that contain a lot of the nutrients for that embryo when the seed germinates. So here's the development of the embryo, the, the diploid embryo that's developed from the zygote, surrounded by the endosperm. And then you've got the <coughs> seed coat, and together this all becomes the seed. And so the ovary will develop into the fruit, which will then contain one or more seeds, like this pea pod here. Seeds um, get to the right place, and under the right conditions will uh, germinate. You have what's called the um, <coughs> hypocotyl, which is the part that becomes the root, basically heads down. And then the epicotyl, which is the part that goes above ground. And then uh, you have the cotyledons. Cotyledons are sort of the first seed leaves. Often they're green, not always. And the, what's above them is the epicotyl, and what's below them is the hypocotyl. Of course, many plants can reproduce asexually. We talked about that with our, with our calancho, and many grasses can just send out shoots, and these aspen trees here can just send out these shoots that will put up a whole new tree. So you can get vast clones. But of course, sexual reproduction is quite important as well. And this slide is supposed to show to us how uh, humans through time have modified plants through selective breeding. This is what's called teosinte up here, which is found down in Mexico, which is the progenitor to corn, which as you can see has a much larger cob with many more and larger kernels than teosinte. But through many, many generations of selective breeding, people got from this to this. And so we've moved beyond that even now. I mean, traditional breeding still occurs, but we're also doing genetic modification, where here you have these rice, these golden rice, that have a gene in them from a completely unrelated type of plant that you could not normally cross with rice, but now it has the benefit of producing a higher level of vitamin A than your typical rice. And golden rice is useful because rice provides a lot of calories to many people around the world, but it's not terribly nutritious. It has plenty of calories, but not a lot of nutrients. And so golden rice is an attempt to increase the nutrient content of rice, in particular with vitamin A. <clears throat> All right, plant responses, just a little bit here. So as uh, we, we talked in Chapter 11 about these signal transduction pathways, and they apply, of course, to plants as well, like all living things. And um, <clears throat> so plants um, respond to particular things, like light in particular. We'll talk about phytochromes. That's one thing. And um, so let's see. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. Now, light is extremely important for plants, and going all the way back to Darwin, Charles Darwin and his son, they did some experiments and looked at light where they, as you probably know, if you put a plant by the window, it'll start growing towards the light. That's not terribly surprising, but they were curious, okay, well, how does this exactly happen? Is it the tip of the shoot or somewhere along the shoot that is responsible for this? And so what they showed was that if you sever the tip or cover the tip, the plant will not respond to the light. Whereas if you leave the tip open or you cover it with a transparent cap, it will still bend towards the light. So it appears that the tip is extremely important when it comes to responding to light. And how does the plant bend and grow towards that direction? 
Well, what do you do is you get differential growth of the cells. So basically on the back side here, those cells grow and elongate more, causing this tip to bend towards the light. What is it that um, causes this? Well, this is an experiment where they took the tip and they put it on a block of agarose, kind of like the same stuff you use with electrophoresis. And so what happens is the block absorbs materials from the tip. They diffuse down in there. And what they showed is that if you take a tip where you have severed the very end of it, if you put a block on there of agarose that has, that has not been exposed to a tip, nothing happens. But if you take a block that has been has absorbed material from a tip, it'll basically act like the tip of the chute and cause it to grow and even cause it to bend if you offset the block. Well, what we found is that there's a particular plant hormone that is produced at the tip of the chutes and the roots for that matter that is called auxin, which essentially causes cell division. It promotes growth of these chutes. And it's often also involved with causing it to bend. So if you have a bit more auxin on one side of the stem, it'll cause those cells to grow more and it'll cause this, this shoot to bend. Here are other plant hormones as well. We won't really draw on all these. We'll talk about auxins and gibberellins a little bit. Um, again, auxins are what promote cell division and the plant growth. And so the tip of a plant, the shoot, tip of the shoot, where the meristem is, exhibits what's called apical dominance. And that is, it's producing a lot of auxin up here, which is causing those cells up there to actively divide, but the amount of auxin decreases as you goes, go down the chute. So that these axillary buds are just kind of hanging out there dormant. <clears throat> well, what happens if you cut off the shoot, top of the chute? Well, those axillary buds start producing a bunch of auxin because they are no longer being dominated by the top. So basically you remove apical dominance, these axillary buds will start to grow, and uh, they'll start producing a bunch of auxin. Okay, And so this is the principle behind pinching back plants. If you have a plant that's kind of tall and spindly, if you pinch off the tip of the shoot, it'll cause it to become bushier because those axillary buds are no longer being suppressed. Gibberellins, you see here, promote stimulation, simulate development of fruits. If you expose certain types of fruits to gibberellins, high concentrations, it'll cause the fruits to get really large. So these table grapes are much larger than your typical kind of grape. They're being exposed to lots of this hormone called gibberellins. <clears throat> Light is extremely important for plants, obviously, and we've you've, you're familiar with this, the visible spectrum of light. Well, when it comes to plants, not all wavelengths of light are created equally. We've already talked about photosynthesis and how the blues and reds are the more photosynthetically active wavelengths, whereas the greens and the yellows not so much. Well, um, red is also important when it comes to something like seed germination. So clearly if you keep seeds in the dark, they tend not to germinate very much. However, if you expose them to a little bit of red light or near red light, they will germinate. But look at this. This is the curious thing. If you expose them to a little bit of red light, but then a burst of far red light, by far red we mean way out here on the edge of the visible spectrum. Whoops, wrong way. Hmm. It's as if they've been in the dark. Red, far red, red, they germinate, etc., etc. So these seeds are clearly differentiating between the wavelengths of light. And if they get some of the near red, they germinate. If they get the far red, they don't germinate. Well, what's that all about? Well, it has to do with these things called phytochromes. And phytochromes are compounds inside of plants that are very sensitive to light. If you expose them to near red light, that converts phytochromes into a form that causes that, that stimulates a signal transduction pathway, which leads to seed germination, also promotes flowering as well. However, if it's exposed to the far red light, it goes to a form of the phytochrome that is, you might say, inactive form. And you don't get seed germination, you don't get flowering. <clears throat> so red light 
is uh, more, um, there's more of it, you might say, in brighter light. And when it's darker, you get more of the far red light. And so this is how plants can take, basically tell whether it's dark or light out, the time of the day, if you will. And so these phytochromes are used to control, like I said, seed germination, also flowering. And so you have some plants that are what are called short day plants and others that are called long day. And so the plants can use the phytochromes to tell whether there's very, there's lots of light in a particular day, it's a long day, or it's a short day. And so things like mums, chrysanthemums, they flowered in the fall when the days are getting shorter. And so if there's a certain length to the day, the um, plant will flower. Whereas on long day plants, they like it when the days are longer and that promotes flowering for them. Now curiously, you can trick these plants is with the chrysanthemums, for example, this is a short day when it would normally flower, but if during the night you basically give it, expose it to some light, it'll think it's a long day and it won't flower, and vice versa with these long day plants. You can trick them into thinking this is a long day, and this is what growers do when they want to try to get plants to flower at times of the year when they wouldn't normally do that, um, whether it's poinsettias in the wintertime or something like that. <clears throat> Okay, so yes, you can trick these plants by exposing them to certain kinds of light to get them to flower or not flower. Another interesting phenomenon, so how do roots know to grow down? How do they know which way is up and which way is down? Well, in them they have these, these, these heavy starch grains called statoliths that will sink down towards the bottom of the plant cell, as you can see here, and in them that's how they know which way to grow. It stimulates growth down. So if you take a plant and you turn it upside down, the root will start going back down with the force of gravity. Um, ooh, last slide. And so what else? Now, how do plants communicate with each other? Well, they use chemical cues. They obviously can't talk, they can't see, they can't hear, things like that. But they can use chemical cues. And so what's happening is, for example, here we have this caterpillar that's chewing on this leaf. <clears throat> So what happens is that damages cells and it releases compounds from that plant that get into the surrounding air. Think about when you cut grass, you get that certain smell. Well, that can communicate with other plants and other plants that get that signal will start to produce, for example, more secondary compounds that will inhibit this herbivory. And in an interesting co-evolutionary relationship, certain wasps respond to this smell as well. They know that this smell means there's some herbivore that's damaging this plant, and it's a herbivore that I can go and lay my eggs on, in particular these parasitoid wasps. They lay their eggs on these caterpillars, the egg hatches, the wasp larva then burrows inside the caterpillar and it eats the caterpillar from the inside out and then it will go through its larval stages and emerge from that caterpillar that is eaten from the inside out and that caterpillar is now dead. And so parasitoid wasps are a good example of biocontrol. Um, growers have started to use them as a way to control pests in their fields. Okay, so there you go. Plant form and function. Sorry, there's, the videos are so long. There's just a lot of information to cover there. Okay, bye-bye.